is when I look at the economy in general and the strength of the consumer, right? I listen, you know, just for, for you and for your listeners, I like to tune in to, to new sources that have like a disparate view of things. So I can see, you know, if I look at Fox or I look at CNBC or I look at MSNBC, it's like you're living in three different worlds because the same story is spun in three different ways. Right. And so you kind of have to say there's some truth in there, there somewhere. Um, But, you know, how you interpret data says a lot about, you know, your um, views of where the economy is heading. Anna, we need to have a conversation about something I have been afraid of. I've actually called it my worst case scenario for housing. I think it is transpiring. Obviously, housing is connected to the economy. It's connected to the Fed. It's connected to race. There's so much going on right now. But I do think we might be living my worst case scenario for housing. How is that for an introduction? <laughs> A little more negative than normal, Michael. Yeah, it's but it's you just know what it's challenging. What you know, I think there's definitely challenges ahead. When you say worst case scenario for you, what do you mean by that? So if people go back and they really parse what I've been talking about for the last three months, my fear was is rates would come down, they'd get in the sixes, we'd unlock the marginal demand, we would not unlock marginal supply, and we would start to see bad behavior in the real estate market. What is bad behavior? Waving inspections, uh, over offers, releasing EMDs. And I had conversations with Beth in Seattle yesterday, Brian Lebo in Vegas yesterday, caught up with an agent in Chicago last night, and all of them are telling me that the numbers that will be reported for February are going to blow you away. Their pendings are crazy. The multiple offers are ludicrous. So yeah. why do I what why do I call this the worst case scenario? I I think six and a half, six to six and a half is like the worst interest rate possible because it unlocks the marginal demand. Buyers feel like they're getting a deal. There's no supply coming. And you know, Beth told me this, this, this hurt when I heard this, she is seeing behavior reminiscent of Q1 and Q2 of 2021, which was the most bananas real estate market I've seen in 30 years. What now, market Brian, is she in, Michael? She's in Seattle. So the median's okay. a million bucks, right? Yeah. And then Vegas, Brian Lebo, I think it's 450 was the median, I want to say. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it, he... January numbers, he showed me January, prices down seven grand or 2%, transactions up like 11%. These are year on year numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, price was month on month, transaction was year on year. Then he okay. told me, you're not going to believe what February will be. It's like the it's like the gun at the Olympics went off and everybody's writing offers. He's writing you know, multiple offers and it's just like, and it's at all price points. The reason we looked, because he's great. He he does these numbers every month for like 20 years. He's like, the reason the price fell down in January is all the transactions were below the median. So it's just how it's just how the median's calculated. Right. right. But he's like, he's like, Michael, we went from having an absorption rate above a million dollars from like 20%, which is one in five listings are pending. He's like, we're over 40% in like three weeks. I'm like, Oh, that's just going to rip the median price higher. So at the yeah. end of the day, I call it the worst case scenario because I don't want to see, I don't want to see bad. I don't want to see, I do not want to repeat of 21. I just, I really don't. Right. That's what I mean by worst case. Right. Right. So I think this is going to be one of those episodes where I disagree with you a little bit. And I, I hope like you do. I don't disagree I, I, because. I, we challenge each other's mindset, right? Because there, there is so much, there's so many things that are different, I think, this time than where we were in 2021. Um, but we are, you know, I this word has been worn out since 2020, but it's true. We are in unprecedented times. There's a lot of things different about today 
than any previous real estate market or economy that we've seen. There's a lot of things that with history rhyme today. And I think we're, when it comes to real estate um, and generally the economy, we're a lot like the 70s, right? We've been talking about that for two years, um, a lot like some previous periods. Um, but I think that this, the late 70s kind of shows us a picture of what we could expect into the early 80s. And so I think what what's interesting is one big cities behave differently than small cities. Ooh. That's just that's something that I've seen. OK, so you okay. mentioned Chicago, you mentioned Seattle. Um, I'm in smaller markets and I'm invested in some smaller markets and I'm actually still seeing softening. And so, oh, good. you know, okay. I think right. that when we talk real estate at a high level, I'll, I think there's some things I agree with you, you know, and what they're saying and what you're saying. But I think. I'm always clued back into real estate is very regional, if not Absolutely. local. And so you can see a lot of, you know, global or national trends that are not necessarily going to be what you're going to see in your market. Um, but I think we still have to kind of look at, you know, where do we think the economy is going to be in the next year or two? Because okay. Also, we see these blips. We see seasonality. You know, spring is always kind of the seller season. And right. yes, it's kind of still winter technically, but it's warming up in a lot of places. And people did see rates come down a little bit, and they're hopeful now that the Fed's going to cut rates. And so I think they're getting a little excited. Um so, I, you know, I, I do think that in some markets, like you said, there's an uptick. My question is, is that just seasonal? My other question, though, and, and you pointed to this a little bit in, in what you said about the high-end homes, is when I look at the economy in general and the strength of the consumer, right, I listen, you know, just for, for you and for your listeners, I like to tune in to, to new sources that have like a disparate view of things. So I can see, you know, if I look at Fox or I look at CNBC or I look at MSNBC, it's like you're living in three different worlds because the it same is, story is. is spun in three different ways, right? Yes, and so you kind of have to say there's some truth in there there somewhere. Um, but, you know, how you interpret data says a lot about, you know, your um, views of where the economy is heading. And on the do me part, from my standpoint, again, I'm very much an optimist, but I, I'm very data driven. I really like to I, I really like to believe that. Um, but it's hard to interpret data when the data sources are one manipulated and two have a big lag effect. And three, we don't see the underlying detail of a lot of the numbers that we look at. So when I think about real estate, I say, well, where's the economy going really? And based upon my view of where the economy is going, I think that this exuberance from investors wanting to get back in to buy homes, I think it's going to be short-lived, Michael. And I think it's in that higher end. So okay. a few points that I'll kind of, you know, just point that pop up at the top of my head. One is 88%, this is as of last week, 88% of family households are living check to check. 88% now. It mm -hmm. was seven, it was 76 to 78% a year ago in these surveys. Okay. So yeah. more people are living check to check, number one. That's going to make people nervous about buying a house if they have to trade up their house payment. And mm -hmm. the reality is for most people that are in houses today already, if they own, if they're going to buy a house today, it's their house payment's going to go up unless they really downsize, right? That's going into these lower end homes, lower, you know, below medium or medium. What we're seeing is that the households that are really pushing up are those that are have the higher income numbers that can afford the higher house payment. So I think just like when you look at the stock market, right, you've got this magnificent seven that have just gone gangbusters. I mean, over 107 percent returns. And I missed out on some of that, sadly, because I thought we would be in recession faster than we are. And so I don't want to you know, be at the end of the tail of exuberance in the marketplace. But when you look at the stock market as a whole, Michael, you see that right now we have crossed something that hasn't happened, I think, in 50 years. It's really dangerous for the market, and it's a good indicator of where the economy is. More stocks are negative than there are positive in the S&P. And so yeah. you might have a few that are doing great, right? But the majority are struggling, more than half. And I think that when you look at households and the economy, 
the top tier, you know, there are larger and larger wealth gaps post COVID. There have been, it's right. been an issue for a long time, but those of us that have more money have been a little more astute in knowing what to do as challenging as that's been to figure out for all of us to make more money when uh, when a lot of people are just struggling they don't know how to do it and so the wealth gaps have expanded and just like not even 75 percent most 75 percent or so of households don't invest in the stock market at all some of them do only through the 401k so even those that are making that killing in the market in the last year, it's usually the wealthier, not the average citizen of which 88% are living check to check. So I think that the economy and the, the average American consumer is in much weaker shape than what most people will say, and that the top end is carrying the market. Where do the top end typically live, Michael? In your bigger cities, right? Really? In the yeah. Seattle's, in the Las Vegas, you know, in, in some of these bigger markets. And so I think that those people generally in um, urban America that, that are living in the cities generally are in that higher end. They still have cash on the sidelines. Their investments, if they have been investing, have done really well over the last year, surprisingly. They've mm -hmm. got some cash and they're like, OK, we want to move. Let's go ahead and do it now. now rates are going to come down, you know, sometimes sometime this year and we will refinance then. But I think if you look at the general consumer in across most of America in suburbia um, and yes, yeah, some wealthy, wealthy families live in suburban markets around big cities. So it's still I'm calling it a, a, a big city market segment at NMSA. Yep. But in real rural America, most people are struggling and I don't think they're going to buy houses. I think this is a short blip. Okay. And I think when the economy weakens further and we get into recessionary territory and I'm going to make a bold call and we'll see if I'm right. I, I like think it. we're in recession now, Michael. It's just not been declared. And I think that the NBER is going to come back. And they're going to backdate the recession and say we've been in a recession at least since the end of last year and mm. currently. And when that happens, the average consumer who only gets their news about where the economy is from from right. their own, you know, from from major networks. And mm -hmm. they start seeing all these job layoffs that are really escalating and they start losing jobs or cutting yep. back on raises, which is happening. I think they're going to be too spooked and they're going to say, this is not a good time to buy a house. It's not a good time to move. Let's stay where we are for a while. And I think transactions come back down, even if we get a temporary blip. Um, in the higher end homes, especially this spring. Yeah, so I like all of that. I think I think uh, one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to ask the audience, right? You all have your buy box or your areas you're shopping in. Let it let Anna know what you're seeing there. She's absolutely right. I may be biased to the top ten markets, and uh, you know if you're if you're focused on that, then you could be misreading, you know, everywhere else. So let us know what you're seeing there. If you're in a smaller yeah. market, what's going on below and above the median? That would be wonderful. Second. And one thing, Michael, just on that point, I have had two properties on the market, okay, for okay. the last several months that okay. I'm like, you know, they're short-term rentals. I have five short-term rentals and I love them all. Um, and and we've talked about this a little bit, not to get too off topic, but um, this the short-term rental market is struggling and softening a little bit too compared to what it was before. And so, you know, there are markets where because of the average American living check to check, 88% of households, they're not spending as much money on travel. And, you know, it's it's been sure. winter, things are a little bit slower, but I've had two properties on the market and the offers that I've gotten have been low ball offers from investors. Mm. They've all been subject to, and they don't want to put hardly any money down. And I'm like, oh, wow. I may sell something with some creative financing, which I've advertised I'll do, but right. it's got to be full price and I got to good amount of money down otherwise it's it's no you know there's no yeah. but for for properties i've sold and bought a lot of properties over the years it's the slowest number of offers i've ever received and these are good quality assets but they still at today's prices and rates they barely cash flow for an investor so the mm. investors are saying uh uh and the the thing that i think a lot of people um, don't give enough credence to is just how many homes were bought over the last few years that were short-term rentals and aren't really residential, especially oh, sure. in yes. some of these markets where people, you know, come for different vacations and things. And so you have more and more supply of those homes on the market. 
and they're just still not cash flowing. And so they're not moving, even if offers are being made because yeah. of price and interest rates. So I'm seeing still, you know, stagnation in the movement in some of these markets. Um, so that's just, you know, another data point to yeah. share with you. Uh, I like it. I'm taking lots of notes because we got lots of things to roll back to. The first one I want to go to, the first one I wrote down was the bifurcated consumer. Yes. Uh, I, I think that is something we all have to understand. And I think we had evidence of it in two earnings uh, announcement. One was from McDonald's, and you can actually add Yum Brands that just released this morning, and Chipotle. Both of those, generically speaking, are kind of in the fast food or easy, you know, Dining, yes. if you will. Uh, I think we're seeing the bifurcated consumer, right? So what do I mean by that? McDonald's and Yum Brands, which is KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut, all missed earnings, all had lower expectations uh, for foot traffic. Chipotle yes. went up, had bet, grew, had higher than expectations, blew out earnings. So even in a category, I would call Chipotle – for the higher end consumer, right? A burrito bowl is 20 bucks or whatever it is. Yeah. I was just and, gonna say my son I've sent my son a couple of times and, and instead of 10 or 20. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's interesting. I, I think there's just more evidence that you're absolutely right. The the economy, and this is why this is part of the reason I want to be very clear that I think this is the worst case scenario for housing. I don't want to see the wealth gap explode even more than it is. It's already horrible today. My fear and why I call it the worst case scenario is over the next 18 to 36 months, the wealth gap goes up 50%. And how would that yeah. happen? Asset owners see an artificial bump in appreciation because there's no supply. And right. then we really could have that renter nation 2030, right? We really could take the thought of home ownership away of American. It's already hard today. Sure. But it could become seemingly impossible. And that that's really where my heart's at. It's like I don't I don't want to see that. Um right. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think you're right. I mean, the more and more I dig into the numbers, you know, that are released on the the health of the consumer, you know, it drives me nuts when I hear the, the consumer's still strong, the recession is off. We've we we've escaped any kind of hard landing. Michael, I will say that that every single time there's been a recession in my you know young adult life and beyond, and th those that I've studied before, then the market always rallies right before. Everyone says it's different this time. Everyone says the consumer is strong, and then boom, all of a sudden, right. everyone's like, "What happened? Everything was so strong a month ago." Well, no, it wasn't. The underlying right. data is what you have to look at, and I'll give you a couple examples of of this you know wealth disparity. So. One of the things that I look at, and I've been pulling up some data on it over the last couple of weeks, is, is auto loan delinquencies, mm -hmm. okay? So during the pandemic, everybody went out after they got free money and went and bought new cars, and they financed those cars, and then they went and bought used cars. And so there was a lack of supply, too, of, of some new cars because they couldn't get parts from all over. So, you know, you started to see used car prices skyrocket, and then, you 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 know, there was a bidding war on new cars, just like there are in houses in some markets. Um, and people started, you know, taking on payments at, at high dollar amount purchases. Well, right now, um, this is in an article that I actually read, I think, on Seeking Alpha, if I remember mm, correctly. I like Seeking Alpha. Um, that yep. just came out this morning, actually, and backs up some other data that I was seeing in the auto loan area. So auto delinquencies, they are up to 7.7% overall. Mm -hmm. And those who are in high income brackets, auto delinquencies are now 4.6%, mm. which is really high for high income earners who are not subprime borrowers. So Correct. there is some struggling. And again, it kind of goes to this 88% are living check to check, no matter what your income is, because it's not as high as it was artificially with pre, you know, post pandemic money um, and the job market and big wage increases and people job hopping, et cetera. But it's still almost a double, not quite, but let's say 75% rough math in my head, 
more on the low end are struggling to make their car payments than those on the high end. So that's one thing. The other thing is when you dig into the unemployment numbers, even though unemployment nationally came out at 3.7%, and everybody says, this is a great number. The consumer's doing great. Most people are still employed. If you dig down into those numbers, Michael, there's two things I want to kind of point out. One is that when you look at the state level unemployment data, this is where data I know is manipulated. I don't know how and why, but it is, right? So the government doesn't want you to think unemployment's going high because they don't want you to think we're in a recession. That's one thing. Um, But state by state, 88% of states have unemployment numbers that have gone up since the last report, 88%. Yeah. Um, Of that number, I think 20% of states are already in recession. Okay, they're they've already said we're in recession. So if 88 percent of unemployment uh, of states are saying unemployment numbers have gone up, then why is the national number down? Really? It doesn't make Mm -hmm. sense. But the other thing in that state job data that you can see is what types of jobs are people being more employed in versus, you know, overall and overall, most of the jobs have gone into the lower end. So there are more jobs in services and in food and in restaurants and in gas stations and, Mm -hmm. you know, things that are 20 to $30 an hour employees. There are more jobs opening there and there are more people working those jobs, but a lot of them are working two jobs. And actually those that pay a little bit more, you're seeing more layoffs and you're seeing higher unemployment. And so you know, those that are in the lower end are working additional jobs. And so there's a little more employment. Some are working two jobs, but Mm -hmm. most of the average to higher end or white collar jobs, employment, unemployment is going up, meaning more and more people are losing jobs. Mm -hmm. They're not getting pay pay raises if you look at payroll statistics. And so again, you know, I think that that the high end is not struggling. True. But the other thing is when you look at job creation, how many jobs are open? This is where I always hear the strength of the consumer. Everybody's going to be fine. We Mm. all have lots of money. When rates come down, real estate's going to go nuts, right? Kind of this argument of the big city stuff. But when you look at job creation, and this is an interesting stat that I just saw, 2023, I will say this, they've looked at jobs and job creation pre-recession. And any time that more than 10% of new jobs have been created by the government, their public Mm. sector jobs, we've had recession immediately follow, okay? Mm. Last year, 2023, almost 25% of all jobs created were government jobs, 25%. So you're more than two and a half times, 250% as many government jobs as what's generally preceded a recession. And if you add to that social service, private sector jobs that benefit, um, you know, any kind of human suffering, um, whether it be, you know, more um, more housing aid for renters assistance, things like that, or more homeless jobs or for migrants, it's over 80 percent of the jobs created in 2023 went to public service. And that wow. tells you that the corporate sector that we're watching the stock market is only creating 12% of the jobs that Mm. are being created today. That is not a healthy economy. It means that corporate profits, corporations are not hiring. Not only are they laying off, but they haven't been hiring for a year. And that is gonna manifest itself into, as the consumer starts to struggle, corporate profits being revised downward. And we're starting to see that. So the headline numbers that grab everybody, Michael, say corporate earnings were good. GDP was good. Hiring and employment were good. But those numbers often get revised and they're all revised downward in the last year. They just are almost all. I shouldn't say all. That's never a good word. But Mm -hmm. the vast majority of the numbers that matter, that show the strength of the consumer, earnings, employment, um, et cetera, both both corporate and individual, they're being revised downward and then it's not hitting the media. So most people think, oh, you know, Bidenomics is working and everything's fine and everybody should be happy with our economy, right? It's an election year. But people are feeling, no, I'm not getting better. What's wrong with me? And the reality Mm. is the economy is weakening significantly. So I just, that view overall of all the data that I look at, Michael, makes me much less 
concerned that real estate is going to just skyrocket with high values. Everybody's going to be locked out. I think we hit a recession. Good. I believe that we're in it now. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming. And I think that that's going to keep that supply really constrained for the majority of homeowners who are not in that higher income market. And maybe the high end goes higher, even though I saw the high end softening first, it may be what yeah. rebounds first. And I, I think we're in for more pain in the economy. Now, the good news as investors, because why did you say that's bad news? Because as an investor, you're competing with competing offers and high prices. Yep. Mm -hmm. The, the, there's always a, a rose to every thorn, right? The thorn mm -hmm. is a recession, but the rose to that is when there is pain, that is when there's more opportunity for us to come in and help other people out to yep. have a solution to their problem that we didn't create, that is created by the economy, but I can help people out and also get really good deals on real estate to where I'm making a, an honest and fair profit. Um, mm -hmm. because of what's going on in the economy. So I think it's getting worse, which is better for real estate investors, honestly. And it also means yeah. the Fed will cut rates faster oh, yeah. than they say they will mm -hmm. in, a, in a lower rate than they say they will. So I'm looking forward to finally um, mm -hmm. the zero, you know, I don't like the zero bound. I think we should never go back to where no. we were before. Mm -hmm. If they do, it means the recession's really bad. So I think they're holding off a bit. And then once they can say, okay, we're in a recession, there's some things that are concerning or a banking crisis, right? They cut rates. As soon as they cut rates, I'm number one, refinancing everything that I have commercial to a 10-year extension and locking in those low rates as long as I possibly can. Not doing can. that again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm buying as much as I possibly can at those super low rates again. And you know, I'm, I'm excited that there's negativity coming. So don't view this yeah. as I'm on as totally oh. bearish. I totally believe the economy is is in a bad path. I think the rich are going to get richer if we know what to do. The poor right. are unfortunately going to be poorer, and we need to be able to be the people that can help them out, right? Not take mm -hmm. advantage of them. But there's huge opportunity coming, in in my opinion, if we're really yes. in a recession and heading there. So let's play with that a little bit. Uh, I always like standing on my call. So last year, Silicon Valley Bank blows up. That weekend or that Monday, I called a recession, Q3, Q4. It didn't yeah. happen. Uh, I licked my wounds for a little while. And then I called a recession, much like you, Q1, Q2. Yep. So I, like yep. you, I think I think we're – what I called was I think Q1 will be re a recession in Q2, meaning negative GDP. We won't know until late Q3, right, because they're always backward looking. Right. That said, I had a very interesting conversation with a mortgage broker. I think it was last week. And something you and I talked about, I think it was nine months ago, was the idea of a rolling recession, right? Oh, yeah. Most most mm -hmm. of the recessions we've experienced were kind of like, it all falls apart, it all goes down, and then it all comes back. There was one rolling recession in the early 90s. It's often called, I think it was 91 was what they reference. And I am at least seeing early shoots that a rolling recession may happen, and it will be yes. led by housing. So let me tell you what I see. Yeah. So first and foremost, what, what did we get right? You and I both said housing was going to go into a depression and transactions were going to crater. Congrats. Yeah. We got that right. But what I'm calling now is in 2024, Anna, I think transactions will go up 10%. I'm not talking price. Don't hear price. I'm talking transactions. Right. But from but, a low, low, low. So still but, low transactions, but up. But, yes, but, I agree. but year on yeah. year, it's up 10%. That yes. will be positive for GDP, as opposed for two years being negative. Right. It's, it's a la the 80s, right? We we crashed in the late 70s, and then we built for a decade coming out, but still mm -hmm. up from there. But what really shocked me, shocked me, is one of the people I talk to every Thursday, Convoy Home Loans, they said, Michael, we did something we haven't done in two years. And I'm like, what, what the heck could that be? We hired three people. Think about the mortgage business. The mortgage yeah. business is roughly 50% the size it was two and a half years ago. They are clearly at the bottoms of the dump depression. If right. they're starting to hire, even incrementally, to me, it feels like, damn, this might be that rolling recession. That's, you know, that theory that we never get to see play out. Right. And then yeah, we have and I, I think we've already been there. Yeah, yeah, I think, sorry. 
Yeah. And, and then, so if this plays out, if a rolling session transpires, housing, it will come out first because it got hit the hardest. Manufacturing is in it now. It'll come out next, right? It's just, you could see the dominoes, and what would what would that mean? It would mean we'd have below trend growth, but not negative, is how I see a rolling recession. Right, and and here's the difficulty with with deeming a recession a recession, right? The the hist historic you know general high level has been two quarters of negative GDP, but the reality is we had that, and they didn't yeah, declare did. a recession. Right. Mm -hmm. Because unemployment was low. And so, you know, for, for one of the reasons. And so, you know, whether the NBER actually declares a recession, to your point, there are many areas of the economy that have been recessionary already. For or depression. <laughs> or, exactly. So, you know, housing. Right. Um, yeah. You look at manufacturing. Manufacturing was on the cusp of recession January 2019th, and then it kind of reared back, right? Mm -hmm. Then you went, manufacturing is generally where most of GDP is produced in the past. And when you look at most leading economic indicators that we've been talking about, you know, for a couple of years, the majority, nine out of 10 leading economic indicators and the yield curve have been projecting a recession for over a year. It's oh, just been delayed. Years, and everyone's yeah. saying, why is it delayed? But it's very heavily skewed to manufacturing because that's where so much of our production has been done in the past. And what happened was manufacturing dipped into a recession already into 2022, part of 2023. And what, what happened was the GDP just shifted into services. So while services is booming and that kept GDP high and government spending kept GDP high, if you again break down that GDP number, manufacturing was down industrials now industrial was booming now it's in a recession and so mm -hmm. you have these different sectors of the economy that are definitely already struggling and struggling substantially you know tech was up but what's happening in tech now now there's still some good but ai hasn't mm -hmm. quite kicked off as people thought and tech companies are starting to lay people off right and so yeah I so let's talk about, so let's talk about this, tech let's talk about tech yeah. because again and again, I could be seeking, I could be self-biased. I mean, I understand, but I'm trying to read all of these things. Yeah, You're absolutely right. So I live in Silicon Valley. One of my homes is there. I know people in tech. Uh, tech had a really hard last summer, right? When Amazon was 10,000 and Facebook was 12,000 or whatever the big numbers were. Now they're tinkering at the edges, 100 here, 250 there. For a company that's got 30,000 or 50,000 employees, that's a fart in the wind. That's nothing, but it still makes headlines. Right. One of the important things in the Facebook announcement or meta that most people missed is they're going to start hiring again. They've been basically on a hiring freeze for nine months. They're starting to hire. Okay. I didn't see that. So it's like this, this, these green shoots, they're very small, but you've got to seek them out. Right. But I'm like, oh, my God, could we actually see a true rolling recession, which is something I've read about and studied in economics. But like it's like a unicorn. You never think you would see one. But sure. It's, I, it's yeah, I think I think we will. And again, not just because we're in a recession doesn't always mean that everything's in a recession either. So lots of recessions have in some ways, you know, some rolling of the recession in and of itself, because every recession varies in everyone thinks about how long will it be and how bad will it be but how diffuse it is is really how many industries are impacted by it and in that recession so recessions are you know measured in length of time how yeah. deep you know how high is the unemployment how high are the layoffs how low is the gdp but then it's diffusion across multiple um, sectors of the economy. And if you look at 2001 with the dot-com bubble, not every area of the economy was in a recession, right? And so I, I think that generally speaking, we've been in a rolling recession, maybe not technically, but you know, there's been pockets of strength. But again, when you come back to the leading economic indicators, and again, it's more manufacturing driven than it is necessarily farming and some other things. But Nine of 10 leading indicators has been in recessionary territory, meaning in recession or just barely above it and floating along that recession line of really low um, for a year, Michael. And so oh, yeah. 
when I look at the, and the leading economic indicators is basically a conglomeration of about 10 indicators of the health of the economy. And when all of that is negative and you start to see the yield curve uninvert, it's a real strong sign yeah. that we are heading for a national recession. So I, I think a, rec a recession is finally going to be declared. I think it's just taken this long because, again, GDP was technically positive and unemployment, even though it's ticking up, if you look at the state responses, mm -hmm. it's about 4.1% versus the headline that was 3.7. So it's still higher than you know what Powell is saying. But mm -hmm. I truly think we're in a recession. It's been rolling and I think it's finally going to be declared. Um, because there's no number, there really is no number that's really super positive other than the stock market has, market has held on and been booming, and those with money are still spending, but most people are not. So that's kind of where I think, I, and I still stand by in the longer term, I think we're in for stagflation, but mm -hmm. we're going to have these opportunities in the sh in a short term cycle. We're finally about to, you know, bottom out. I think in a recession, um, that that's the short term trends, the cyclical trends, and you've got your secular trends. So I think over the long term, I wouldn't be surprised if we have longer term rolling recessions oh. where some come out of the recession, some stay in it, and we have low growth and we have you know, higher inflation coming back at some mm -hmm. point. Um, yep. And, you know, we have a low growth decade, kind of a lost decade. So we've got to find those pockets of change yep. in the cyclical mm -hmm. short term changes in this longer secular trend, I think of, you know, lower growth, higher inflation, higher taxes, you know, that's coming for sure too. probably a topic for another show, but mm -hmm. um, there's pockets of opportunity. And, and I, I look at this as, okay, 2022, you know, was pretty good the first half. Late 2022 was tough. 2023 was tough as real estate investors to find, especially if you're in commercial, right? We're already in a deep commercial depression, I would say. Um, unlike residential being transactions, commercial, it's also asset prices. But I think as rates come back down in a recession, that's good for asset prices when rates are low and they're asked, you know, they're, they're rate driven or impacted by interest rates. So optimistic about the next year, year and a half, even though I think we're going to be in a recession. Um, I'm looking at it as a huge opportunity, you know, to really make some money where it's been tough over the last year and a half to find great smoking yeah. deals. I think more are coming. No, I, I agree with all that. The other thing I wrote down that you talked about that we're just going to work in here is Airbnb, right? You talked about a couple of your five listings you have out there. Uh, I want to give a shout out to people that I think called this first, at least in my world, Melody Wright on Twitter. She's been on the channel a couple of times. And then there's a Twitter handle called Texas Runner, I think is uh, what she goes by. Both of them have been talking about Airbnb. But what I wanted to go to you, Anna, on is I think there's a big question. I'll say it this way. There is a lot of buyers who, frankly, I'm going to say lied on the mortgage application. They said it was a second home. Yeah. They said they were going to live there, you know, whatever the number is, the 30 days a year or whatever it is. And it was always going to be an Airbnb. They just lied to get the best rates. They lied to get the lowest down. They, you know, all of that. And a lot of these folks took out DSCR loans, right? Not conventional. Um, I'm, I'm just Can I push wondering. back on something real quick yeah, that please. you just said, just please. to clarify. So one, DSCR loans in and of themselves are made for those who are not going to occupy. So if you tell true. them it's a That's second true. home I'm going to occupy, you can't get a DSCR loan. You're right. And You're right. the thing about second homes, in order to qualify for a home loan that's a second loan, you have to qualify for the mortgage even if you never brought any income in. Because I've done several ah, of them. Interesting. So it actually is harder to qualify for a second home loan. And okay. you can say, this is my second home and I intend to rent it out. But even if you intend to rent it out, they give you they give you zero dollars to qualify for that loan. So they give you the loan as if you're never going to get rental income. Okay. So it's harder to lie on those because they're much harder to qualify for. Where okay. I think that you do have some of that is people that say, and even then, people that aren't buying it as a second home, uh, that they're going to rent it out, maybe they boost what they think the income is, but that's hard to get by with with the loan apps because they do appraisals, they do rent valuations, they do. So I think mortgage fraud in the short-term rentals is probably much, much lower 
than okay. what you just said, just because Good. I've had to qualify for all kinds and none of them, even second homes prevent you from running them out. It just makes okay. it harder to qualify for, but you can get in with 10% down instead of 20 and you okay. get a much better rate. This is, this is why I come to you. Cause I don't have any of these. I just read what I'll call yeah. doom comments. So yeah. is it, so what I guess I hear you saying is, yeah, there might be some, I'll call it mortgage fraud. I'm not sure what to call it other than that, but not as much as maybe some folks fear because again, the qualification was different. Uh, DSCRs, yeah. you can't say you're owning. Um, I can tell you this, you know, I've every, I'm mostly commercial, but I, I, I have a lot, all the other stuff that I've bought, whether it's big or small, I've used smaller mm -hmm. regional banks because yep. they know me. It's easier to qualify for loans going through government approval process for 30 <laughs> year fixed financing yeah. is brutal and the more you have and the more you're invested in the harder it is and so i'm into that Man. i i brutal. every time the last one i did was my fifth short-term rental and i went through fannie mae 30 year fixed financing second home if i qualified and by the fifth one i didn't have enough income if i couldn't use any of it to to get the 10 percent down so i went investment property loan 15 percent down a little bit higher interest rate but still pretty good i swear i'll never i'll never do it again because it's such oh, a yeah. headache and it's it's always to the last minute the way they calculate things. And so um it's harder, it's hard to qualify for those. And DSCR, okay. if there's any fraud that went through, and I'm not saying that there isn't, but right. more than anything, I think if if you have appraisals that give it a higher value or a higher rental value mm -hmm. than what has been proven historic or it relied on. 2021 data, 2022 data, when you yeah. have really high income. To me, that. that's where the bigger yeah. issue is. And it's okay. not necessarily that there was fraud, but there was this exuberance on the yeah. part of both the investor Bubble. and yeah. the lender, because yeah. the lender wants to do loans. They're, they're paid to do loans, right? They want to mm -hmm. give you loans. So I think they're going, hey, if you can show me some stats of comparable properties that got this much last year, we'll give yeah. you credit for that much income. And what's okay. happening is that last year, rental income softened in most markets. Now you'll look at stats again, nationally, Airbnb, you know, type of Airbnb, VRBO, MASH, Pfizer, they put out stats, they say income was up, but it was only up in certain areas and certain right. markets. And so the issue for me was short-term rentals. And I knew this could happen. And I think I talked about this on the show when I bought a few of them, right? I said, I'm taking advantage of record low interest rates that I can lock in for 30 years. And for me, they're lifestyle investments that I can rent them out and make it cost me nothing to enjoy homes, pass them to my children. I have some appreciation. I have huge tax benefits. And I think some of them are going to go up in value. And I bought kind of strategically. But I even said, even if they don't go up in value, because you know, we start to have some kind of real estate correction or there's oversaturation. I, I bought them knowing that I could afford to hold them. Even if we had a recession, that was my biggest fear. Even in 2021 and 22, when I bought them, I said, I think we're heading to a recession. I think my income is going to be lower. So what I did when I estimated my numbers is I, I took a lower new number for for um, income than what they had made the year before. So I wasn't going to be super disappointed because I was conservative. But what most people did, Michael, is they this is what happened in short term rentals. They said, I got a little extra money. I'm going to put it on a down payment. And I've been told by all the gurus that I'm going to make $50,000 a year on this one property. And because short term rental travel was so high in 2021, around water and mountains. That's just always where values go up and people people rent. Um, they assumed that that's always what they were going to make. And they weren't able to afford to hold it without that much income coming in. So they bid up the price to get a high enough, the biggest property they could get with the most rental income. And now that travel has softened, especially in the million dollar home range, you know, where they just thought they're all going to be there. Well, then suddenly like in, in Pigeon Forge, for example, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of, of million dollar homes were built. Well, there's not that many families that want to rent a million dollar home that are still renting them at that pace. So mm -hmm. they assumed great income. They didn't assume any softening or any recession bringing income down. And suddenly they can't make the mortgage payment because not enough people are traveling at those high rates. So I think that's the real issue is that people 
bought on hopium. They thought right. one year was enough. They'd lock themselves into the mortgage payment, but that rental income is soft and now they can afford it. And so what's happening is a lot of people are listing their properties. And so the supply is up in those markets. Yeah. Yes, there's offers, but they're trying to lowball the most motivated seller because mm -hmm. those that are selling right now, there's a few of us like me that are like, if I can still get top dollar, because I think there's some softening, I might go ahead and sell one or two. I want some liquidity to take advantage of some other things. But if I don't sell it, I don't have to. So I'm just like right. putting it out there and seeing. But most people that are listed right now, they're highly motivated because they overbought they overestimated income. They, they're they living check to check and they just can't afford to float those payments, especially yeah. when it's not summer season. So pain is coming there for sure. I was trying okay. to get ahead of it with a sell of one of mine. The other thing that's happened, Michael, and this has happened in res this will happen in residential, but it's first, I think, in some of the short-term rental markets. So why am I selling one of mine in Florida? I have two and I love them. They're both oceanfront, but my taxes mm. almost doubled in two years. I estimate taxes going up to the new, you know, the new purchase price time the millage rate. I always include that yep. when I'm estimating numbers, but it went way up more than that. But my insurance has more than doubled on both Florida properties in a yeah. year and a half. And there's no end in sight as to that happening. So in markets like Louisiana, coastal markets, California, Florida, the taxes and insurance have, have eaten in so much to the income as well as a decline in rental rates. It just means that you're cash flowing a lot less. And that is something that nobody really could have anticipated that insurance would have gone up as much as it has. I mean, I had a property go from 12000 to 23000 in a year just for insurance, yeah. you know. So that's going to mean a lot of people put their house on the market, a lot of increase of supply. But on the negative end, those who are buying them today have higher interest rates. Even if the price comes down, they can't cover the new taxes and insurance and still be as profitable. What does that do? It brings down prices. So for, if yeah. you're selling, that's bad. But if you want to buy something you're going to hold long term, those are markets you want to go into and pick them up at a depressed price because, you know, they're not working yeah. today and you hold them and you hope that all these things work themselves out. But short-term rentals are just a different breed and they've got their own challenges. But if you're in a coastal market, you know, I think that prices still could fall. Mm -hmm. Unlike these big cities you were talking about at the beginning of the show, Chicago, okay. Seattle, where prices are starting to go up. Okay. Well, let's get into one more topic that we'll talk about and that's banking crisis 2.0. I'm sure you've seen the headlines with, I think it's New York oh, Bank yes. Corp identifying yes. some commercial loans blowing up. It it feels to me that we have yet to see the blow up because of commercial real estate and it's coming. Yes. And maybe it's starting to happen. Maybe we're in the early, you know, maybe New York Bank Corp's first. It has to happen, yeah. right? There's got to be banking Absolutely. prices 2.0. And, you know, after, the, after we had the first couple banks, Signature Bank, um, SVP, you know, start to go down and the Fed came in with the bank rescue program, right? Mm -hmm. Um Bail out, said, bail I, out. <laughs> bail out. Exactly. That's exactly. Um, it I said this is this is for bonds now, but commercial real estate has the same problem, right? And a lot exactly. of people were just That's worried about thing. bonds. Yeah. Because too. the the issue is, and again, yes, they had a lot of tech investors. They they snapped their fingers and everybody pulled their money at one time. So yes, yeah. there's part of that. But the sure. reality is most banks are required to hold certain assets that are that have been considered low risk, the lowest risk assets for a long time, especially post 2008. Bonds, commercial real estate, high yeah. quality commercial real estate. Agreed. Right? So yep. banks hold those safe assets on the books and they're safe unless the Fed historically raises rates 5%. Um, and suddenly the value of bonds and commercial real estate just by nature of the rates crashes. People don't understand why is there so interest at commercial real estate? Okay, office has 30% vacancy, but Commercial real estate, for those that don't know, is valued based on the income divided by a cap rate. And a cap rate is essentially a going rate of return that an investor expects to make on the income based on their purchase price if they paid cash. So you're comparing dollars, apples to apples, treasuries to real estate, right? Well, if a if a treasury was paying one, which it was a few years ago and some change, um, I would want a three and a half percent return if I paid cash for a brand new apartment building, Okay. That's a three and a half cap. But when a treasury goes to four, I want a six and a half cap. 
because I'm taking risk above mm -hmm. what I could park it in the treasury. So if I take the same income on the same great property, but I just divide it and say, now my investors want a six and a half percent return instead of a three and a half percent return, Michael, that drops the value they're willing to pay for that asset by 50%. Yeah. So we've already seen it's 30 to 40% exactly. decreases in value. And a lot of, unfortunately, operators having to hand over the keys. It's not because they did something shady. Yes, it's easy to pile on them. Some took risks, right? We're all in the business of taking risk for higher reward than what we can get in a treasury. If we're all honest with ourselves, every one of us is in the business of taking risk, right? Some took more risk than they should have. But the bottom line is commercial real estate loans are not fixed for 30 years like residential. Yep. So we don't get that benefit. So most investors took out floating rate debt because the Fed said, we're not going to raise rates. Yeah, they did. Inflation's yeah. fine. We're not going to raise rates. And brokers told us, Lana, the Fed said they're not going to raise rates. Get a variable loan because you don't want a million dollar plus prepayment penalty if you lock in for five and sell in two or three. Okay. And we'll just give you rate insurance that'll cap the amount that you pay. And people bought that, but the rates went way up from there and they have to be refinanced. So to the point mm -hmm. about the banks, just like you had bonds maturing that once were worth this when they sold paid 2% coupon, now that someone could buy one at a 4% coupon, the bonds drop at 50% in value. Those are a large piece of the assets on the bank's books. So if their asset value falls below their liabilities, they're insolvent and they fail. Yep. Well, same thing with commercial real estate. They've got these loans on the books, especially regional banks, not your Chase, Wells Fargo, no, JP, yeah. you know, whatnot, regional. but your, your regional banks, they hold about, depending on who you look, 60 to 80% of commercial real estate. Okay. Suddenly the value of their assets, let's just say they've all been cut 40 to 50%. If you've got a large amount on your books of commercial real estate and you have to you have to mark them to market. So this yeah, was the whole thing. Market. There's yep. there's hold to maturity securities, which includes you know commercial real estate loans, bonds, things like that. And then there's available for sale. They hold them to maturity so they don't have to write down the value. But the minute they have to make them available to sell, which happens when they had to come up for refi, they have to mark them down and that brings their asset values down. So a lot of these loans were done, Michael, in 2021 and 2022. Most have a two to three year with one year extension. So let's say three to four years from 2021. 2024 is just really the beginning. Now, some had a two, a lot of them were two-year loans with a one-year extension. So 2021 took you to 2023. That's when we started seeing the problems. Yep. They couldn't, they wouldn't extend them a year. Now we're in 2024. So we're this year is really the first year yeah where you're going to start seeing more fallout than what we had before oh. and into 2025. And so I believe that a lot of regional banks, and here's the problem, they can't just, I heard this argument, they can't just say, um, we will extend and pretend. We Your property value is less today and rates are higher, but we're just going to keep letting you pay a lower interest rate. They can't because banking regulations, rules, things that they buy to offset the interest rate that they offer, Tell the banks when they come up for refi, you have to recheck their loan to value. You have to recheck their debt coverage service ratio. Auditors look at that every year. When I send my financials oh, my in every year, they look at that, right? Now, mm -hmm. if it's not up for renewal and I'm making my payment, they're not going to try to go, well, you got to pay more because we think it's worth less. But when it comes up to renew the rate, they re-underwrite you, whether you have to refi into a new loan or just update your rate. And because values have fallen 50% and these loans were done at 75 to 80% LTV, you own you owe 20 to 25% more than what it's worth. Mailing the in banks, the keys. The yeah. banks cannot legislatively, based on rate bank regs, refi a loan without making you pay in money to get that yeah. loan value and payment where it needs to be. So banks are in a lot of trouble as soon as these loans come up for renewal, unless the Fed comes in with another rescue program. And that's why the yeah. economy sometimes is really hard to, to peg because I can say we should be repeating a savings and loan crisis of 1980s after the 1970s did the same thing. I, I that's agree. what is coming. But the question is, our Fed and our Treasury have shown since 2008, they are do willing to do whatever it takes to stop contagion. And so I think they start backdoor negotiating rescues yeah. of 
these failing banks. I agree. They come up with additional bank rescue programs. It's supposed to expire in March. I don't think it's going to. Oh, it'll, it'll um, be renamed something else. Yep. It'll be something else. So the Fed will not let the banking system fail, um, but they will let the, the syndicators and the operators oh, lose yeah. and the funds lose oh, yeah. their property. Then they're going to work with the banks to say, how do we keep you open when this is a temporary blip in value? Or then they slash rates. Then your assets are revalued and asset prices go back up Bingo! and the bank is okay. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of what I expect. But, you know, what do I know? We will dig into this banking crisis 2.0 next week because I think there's a lot more there. Anna, real quick, where can people find you? Great. You can find me here every week on your channel. If you're interested in real estate coaching or deal review um, consulting, you can find me at AnnaKellyInvesting.com. Thank you so much.